Welcome to Memorable Marketing by Media Group. This is episode 23. We are interviewing John Jorgensen, who is the CMO of Cambian Learning Group. Cambian Learning Group is an almost a billion dollar company, and in five years, they've grown fivefold. He was hired in November of 2019, so right before the pandemic. How did they evolve that? How did they solve that? Find out. But most importantly, they put people first. I think that's a very important lesson. Check out this episode. It's really good. We're looking for ways to build not just brand awareness, but brand affinity. Welcome to Memorable Marketing by Media Group. Uh, this is episode 23. And today we have John Jorgensen on it. John, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, Thomas. It's great to be here. And what was your story and your journey prior to joining uh, Cambion Learning Group? So I, uh, my career started uh, 25 years ago. Um, I was a liberal arts major in college and took a job in publishing as an editor uh, because that was the job I thought that I could get at the time, being a liberal arts major. So, um, I, so I did that for, for a few years and then I moved on to do creative work and then eventually to do strategic marketing for uh, some K-12 education imprints. Um, and I've been working in marketing and, and branding ever since. I've been in the financial sector, nonprofit sector, and and most of the career I've been in the ed tech sector, uh, which is what uh, Cambium Learning Group is um, operating within. And uh, I, I've, it's just, a, it's a great industry to be a part of. And um, I've just, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Okay. It's always interesting to hear people's background CMOs because CMOs are not a protected title like a doctor or a dentist. So there's no exam one has to pass, right? So it's a it's a given title and it's always interesting. So some people have spoken to a, a former botanist, some were a, a milk smelter before they, they became CMOs. So it's just interesting that people have so vast backgrounds. And I, that's what I love about our, our business is that people come from all walks of life and liberal arts. Love it. Thank you. So tell yeah, me. I, um, I, had, I had no idea what a CMO was when I was in college, that's for sure. But it was great preparation for it without me even knowing it. Okay, that's good. So what is Cambian Learning Group and, and what is your business model? What do you, what do, you do? So uh, Cambian Learning Group is a portfolio company uh, within the education technology space. Uh, it contains five uh, distinct business units and serves the, the K-12 segment of the edtech space, mostly in, in the United States, but uh, we have we have customers worldwide as well. Um, the, the businesses that make up Camby Learning Group are, are Lexia Learning, Learning A to Z, Explore Learning, uh, Time for Learning, and Cambium Assessment. And as of today, we're, we're getting close to being a billion dollar company in terms of bookings. We're serving uh, 20 million plus students, more than 30% of the teachers, the K-12 teachers in the US use Cambium in uh, 94% of the U.S. school districts. And then, um, as I mentioned, we're also in 170 countries worldwide. Um, we, we sell into multiple verticals in terms of business model. We sell to individual teachers, to schools, to districts, in, and directly to states. Um, one thing that makes Cambium unique is that we've intentionally built a uh, house of brands architecture, brand architecture, where a share, shared services kind of takes care of all of the corporate responsibilities that businesses often don't want to deal with, things like uh, legal and finance and HR and IT and, and, and even brand strategy. My role is is at the corporate level for largely for brand strategy. Um, and what's great about this is it, it allows the business units to stay very focused on, on two things. One is uh, product innovation, making sure they're making the best possible products for their distinct audience. And then customer success, making sure that those customers are successful. They're not having to worry about um, all of the other aspects of running a business. They're really focused on on products and customers. So, you know, that makes Cambium special because we're able to then provide uh, to build and then deliver very targeted solutions that are the absolute best in their respective space. They're the most loved by people. NPS uh, regularly confirms this for us, and they are just the most. Um, the most successful kind of leading products within their respective vertical. Most other companies they uh, of scale like ours, they take kind of the opposite approach where they combine everything into one giant company. They like to maximize efficiencies um, and and have kind of a single a single story. We have found that that might be better for us, but it's not better for the 
the customers that we're trying to serve. They really want uh, the best possible solutions to the distinct problems that they're trying to solve. And so by having this structure, we're able to deliver that, but um, also realize a lot of efficiencies with the shared services model. Ah, got it. So let me just walk back a couple of steps. So you said the vertical integration. So you're selling to state. So obviously if a state buys, then it's for all the schools. You can sell to a school or you can sell to a teacher or you can sell individuals to students. So is it's the same program, but you are branding in different ways. Was that what I hear you saying? Or is it all Cambian? Or do you have different brands that covers it the various? Yeah, that, no, that's a good question. So um, it is. It, it depends on the business unit and the, the product brands that are within that business unit. So for example, Learning A to Z is one of our business units. They have products that are uh, sold largely to, um, to schools and districts, but also sell directly to individual teachers. The price point is lower. The, the entry point is easier. Um, the, the solutions are very kind of plug and play solutions that can be used in all sorts of different ways. So teachers often will um, get out their own credit card or have uh, someone at the school do that for them to get it just for their classroom. Obviously, we are trying to have a bigger impact. So we would much prefer to sell to a school in a district um, and make sure everybody is covered. But but it does lend itself well to that to, the, to that structure too. So yeah, it just depends on the business unit, depends on the product. Um, can be assessments kind of the opposite of that, where we have a lot of state level deals for summative assessment that happens um, at the state level. So they're not dealing with, with teachers and schools and districts per se, it's, it's done at the state level. So it, it just depends on the business unit. Okay. And so of course, in order to service those different uh, segments, of course, there's a different message for a student. There's a different message for a teacher, for a school district, or for a state. So, how do you do that from a marketing perspective? How do you, how do you, have these different messages or stories, as you, as you said earlier? Yeah, I, I think that that's really um, the that's where the business unit structure becomes powerful because each of the business units has its own go-to-market team. Uh, so they are developing their own their own products, their own marketing and, and, and messaging, their own, their own brands. And then their sales teams are, and customer success teams are, are working um, just for that business unit. So you're absolutely right. The, the, the way that the businesses uh, talk about themselves, the products they put forth, um, it depends. It depends on the business unit. What I will say is that, um, and this is something I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about uh, a little bit more, um, they're all part of Cambium. So all being part of Cambium, part of my job at the Cambium level as CMO isn't to uh, run those go-to-market teams at each of the business units. It's to um, provide them with uh, connective tissue that that is a story in and of itself that makes sense in terms of, well, why do you have these companies? Why are they all together? What 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 values do they share? What purpose do they share? And so that's that, that's a lot of what I'm doing at the Cambium brand level is telling that story, which of course is relevant to the K twelve space, but um, is also relevant to to investors. Okay, gotcha. So in terms of marketing, it's what I want to talk about. Of course, so is so when you go online, of course, when you're targeting students, it might be on Facebook or parents. I guess if they're underage or they don't have a credit card yet, it's the parents you're actually targeting and then on teachers. So do you have different different strategies to do that on on the various platforms and, and how do you do that? Can you go in more detail with that? Yeah. It, it, um, one of our business units, you mentioned parents, is uh, time time for learning. It's a, home, a digital homeschool curriculum. And that's something where uh, we are selling. It's, it's, it's a B2C model. It, it doesn't even involve schools and, and districts. It goes right to parents. Um, by definition, it, it's homeschool. And so that team is structured very differently than some of the other more traditional B2B kind of K-12 companies that we have. And they, they, they don't have a sales team, for example. They have, a, they have an e-commerce team. They have a, a digital marketing team. And so all of the campaigns they're doing, are everything is digital. They certainly have uh, PR and some other tactical things that they do, but all of their business is coming through their e-commerce channel. So um, in, in a very B2C way. So that, that team looks very different than uh, certainly than a Cambium assessment, which also doesn't really have a sales team because they're having everything is done through RFP processes, through um, through state level uh, relationships and and conversations. And so, um, yeah, it just it, it, we one of the things that's really interesting about this position at this company is that diversity is the fact that yes, we're all in in education, we're all in in 
uh, education technology in particular, um, but all very different. And, and it's, it's just very, and it's changing very dynamically. The pandemic has sort of changed things, um, even how some of those more traditional B2B uh, teams have operated. Interesting. And the, the various programs you have, is that subscription-based or is it a one-time fee or how do you operate from, from a business point of perspective? Yeah, most of uh, most of the businesses are subscription-based models. Um, digital companies, we, we definitely have, um, the Cambium Assessment is the, is the biggest example of a company that is is different. It's a state-level contract, often multi-year, uh, just because they're kind of big um, big relationships that have a lot of complexity to them on the assessment side. So, um, so that one is a bit different, but the other businesses are almost exclusively digital um, along with, with services. We, we have one uh, really successful product in particular at our Alexia business unit that is all about um, training teachers to, uh, to be, to, to training teachers to be better literacy teachers. And so there, there are services and, and, uh, curriculum that go with that, but um, but for the most part, part of what's made us so successful and so attractive uh, to investors is the the digital uh, DNA. When you joined um, as a CMO, um, what was the, some of the challenges you met at the time when you joined, and how have you uh, corrected them, or how have you implemented them in the, in the period you've been at uh, Cambium? Yeah, I, you know, I say my role today is um, it, it was a new role when I came aboard in November of uh, 2019. Um, and there are kind of three parts to it. And, and we've been in large part figuring it out as we've gone along because it's all, it's all been new. And even though I have, I've had CMO experience, it's been in a, in a very different, different situation. So um, I, I kind of always go back to three things. One is I'm, I'm here to engage the world in uh, Cambium's brand story, which means lots of different things. But I am kind of the, the person who is out there talking about, uh, well, who is this company? Why should I care about it? Um, so trying to engage various audiences um, in that story. A second one is to, to work really closely with um, each of those Cambium businesses to do the same thing for their brands. Um, I'm not standing up on a mountain telling them, okay, we, you need to do this, you need to do that. I'm there to be of, of service to them and to be kind of consultative and helping them to um, ele elevate their brand the best that, that we can, but then also to better kind of connect it into the Cambium story as well so that the, the collective makes sense, not just the, the business itself. And then the last thing, and this is the one that I, I actually like talking about the most, which is it's to help uh, Cambium realize its purpose, um, both, both externally and internally. And pur purpose is really, really important for us. It's really important for, um, for most CMOs. And I think um, you know, we really are trying to have more of an impact on people's lives. And because we're not in the education, we're in the education space. We're not, we're not making widgets or something. We're doing something that is all about changing people's lives. So when I think of purpose, um, you know, I, I, I always kind of react. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not the, the biggest fan. A lot of my colleagues know this because I've, I've, talked about it ad nauseum, but, you know, mission statements and vision statements and all of that. Um, you know, vision is great. It's, it's a point of view about the future. It answers the question, you know, what's that future look like? Uh, not just for your business, but for the world around you. Um, mission can be, can be really great. You know, if the, if the vision's about the future, the mission's about, well, how are you going to do that? You know, how are you going to make that happen? What's your plan? It's sort of a, um, you know, you have kind of finite goals that are going to get you there. But but the reason we talk about purpose is because we're this collective of companies and we needed to have a kind of very powerful but focused rallying cry that these companies could all be um, kind, kind of built around. And so um, it really comes down to the question, well, why do you exist, Cambium? Um, what is the purpose that, of your existence? And And our purpose is very, very simple. So the, the biggest kind of existential challenge that education, um, certainly in, in the U.S., but, but it's a global issue, is that there's a single challenge. And that, that challenge, as we see it after talking to tons of teachers and students and um, people in the ed tech space, is that we want our, our purpose is to help all students and teachers feel seen, valued, and supported. So it's this kind of all-encompassing statement um, the operative word there is feel. 
it's about helping teachers and students feel differently than they have been for lots of different reasons. This is absolutely the North Star for everything we do, the products we design, the experiences we deliver, um, even the way that we work together as a team or, or treat our staff. We're just 100% focused on doing everything we can to make sure that everyone feels seen, valued, and supported. And again, not just the teachers and students, but even, even about us. So in terms of my role as CMO, um, you know, in some ways, CMO is kind of a misleading term. It, you could almost call me a, a chief brand officer or a, or even a chief purpose officer. I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit of a hokey idea, but that really is what it's about. My role, more than anything else, is about rallying the team, um, rallying the ed tech space, pushing and pulling uh, all of us kind of toward that that purpose. Um, that that is what we're that, that's what our brand is all about is is about that purpose I mentioned and trying to engage people in it. I like your, your your vision versus the north star. What is that? Why are we doing this? What's what's driving us? What's getting it out out of bed in the morning? That's, that's important to have. So I like that. Um, in terms of you said you joined in November two thousand nineteen, and it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out that about March twenty twenty, all the plans went out the window. The whole world changed. I mean. Obviously, this has impacted every business on the planet, but for your business, it must really, really have impacted because people were forced to stay at home or all around the world. Tell me about what happened during that. And I, I guess all the best laid plans we had in November didn't matter in, in, in March. Or can you tell me from your perspective what happened? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was an unbelievable moment, wasn't it? You know, for everybody. Uh, and, and we were no exception. I think when, when March of 2020 <clears throat> rolled around, we didn't know what was going to happen. And so um, we had a lot of conversations with our leadership. Uh, we had no idea how we were going to deliver services or, you know, people weren't going to school anymore. And so or they were doing it virtually. And so how do we help them with that? I, I, I think that, um, and our CEO just talked about this recently. He, and we were kind of recollecting about it um, in, in another interview. Um, it, it came down to kind of taking a breath and listening. And not uh, kind of flying into action, pivoting this way and that way. It was about okay, um, how can we help here? And luckily, we were a very successful company of scale, very healthy financially, um, diverse customers because of the business unit structure. And so, um, you know, we, we just said to ourselves, like, what needs to be done here? And and, and our starting at our CEO uh, John Campbell. We made this the decision, which sounds a little um, Pollyanna-ish, but but it was very true, and it kind of guided everything. Which is, we were going to put people first. So, and that didn't just mean the teachers and students; it also meant the employees. And so, we did a couple of things to sort of back that up. The first one was many of our our kind of student centric digital solutions um, we offered for free. We said, look. We don't know how you're going to do what you're doing. Um, we want to help you with that. Um, and so we had, we kind of mobilized into, um, you know, I was just reading, I'm reading a biography of uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and talking about World War II and how, you know, the auto industry, for example, mobilized to start creating, um, you know, things for the military. We, we kind of pivoted in that same way where people throughout our organization just started working in a very bespoke way with all of our, our customers, all of the schools and districts to say, okay, where are you at? How can we help you? We don't want to get in your way, but we can give you these free digital products. We can offer services. Um, we just want to help you figure out what to do uh, initially. And then that had just continued through the year as they figured out how to shift to a virtual environment, or in some cases, a hybrid environment of virtual and in-person. And so we just became a very consultative organization providing our digital resources uh, at no cost, um, having no idea what that was going to mean for our business, but it just, it was the right thing to do in the moment. And we had trust that, you know, that was our intention was to, to be helpful, that we were all going to come together and we trusted that the business was going to be okay. The same thing happened with our, our employees where we immediately put an end to all travel, closed all of our offices. Everybody started working remotely we had no idea how that was going to go. I mean, how can you not travel? How can you not go into an office and, and work together? But all of it worked spectacularly well, um, mm. unbelievably well. And th the end result of, of all of that kind of putting people first and, and trusting the business was going to be okay was in 2020, 
uh, we had our by far our best year ever. And in 2021, we had an even better year. And Cambium's grown by a factor of five in the last five years with huge growth in 2020 and 2021. And and not just growth that was that was sort of bottom line growth. That that was part of it, but it was the impact we had, the 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 um, a number of students and teachers that we were able to serve and the way we were able to pivot our organization to be a, now a remote first organization. None of that was going to happen uh, on its own. This this pandemic kind of forced us uh, down this path and accelerated a lot of this, which um, certainly it's been a challenge and I don't mean to minimize any of it, but it also has resulted in some of some growth that has maybe been painful, but has just taken us to new places. So um, in a lot of ways, yes, it, it meant we had to change our plans and and pivot in lots of ways, but it, it also c- caused us to sort of say, okay, well, what's most important? Let's focus on that. Let's deliver it really well. And the results have been have been amazing. John, you operate in a very crowded uh, educational online space. Um, how are you different from other um, other providers out there? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we talked a little bit about this, but I think the, um, the the structure that we have is something that that certainly distinguishes us from other organizations. We aren't trying to uh, grow through uh, efficiency, maximizing efficiencies and consolidation. We're trying to grow each respective business um, faster than it might grow on its own. So that structure with the shared services um, is is really important for that. Providing the autonomy to the business units, you know, when we acquire a business, um, uh, the, the president is still the president and the, the, the head of sales is still the head of sales. You know, we don't we really like to minimize the changes that we make that would be disruptive. So um, so so we, we, we grow through uh, two ways. One is growing organically, which is what I just described. You know, we try to, to fuel that growth. Um, the other way is is inorganically through M and A, and I think one of the ways that the ed tech space, uh, the reason it's so dynamic right now and so much growth, um, a lot of noise, uh, as you mentioned, and so um, we try to stay kind of above that in the sense that we we don't just go out and buy companies because uh, we can get them at a good price or because they might have some short term. A benefit for us or some PR benefit for us. Um, we we literally look at uh, you know three to four acquisitions every week, like really look at them, doing diligence on them. And in the last three years, we've acquired three three businesses, and we're just very very picky. And if if the company doesn't fit with uh, our purpose and and isn't about having a real impact and can show that they have an impact that they're a healthy business they're a digital business um that they they solve a problem better than any anyone else in the space we aren't interested and we pass on it and that and that's meant that we've passed on a lot of um good businesses but just not the ones that are the absolute best for us so i think that there's a level of um of discipline that that we have we don't chase shiny objects uh and we we stay really focused on um, not losing sight of that that purpose that I mentioned. If it's not something that can can add to that, can't make us better. Um, you know, we're not interested in sort of one plus one equals two and a half kind of combinations. You know, we're looking only for the very best um, in terms of growth. So um, that's not different. I mean, most businesses of scale in ed tech are looking to grow organically and inorganically. But the way that we do that um, by letting the organic growth happen at the business unit level and supporting that. Um, providing a, a better product and better service to customers, and then inorganically just being very disciplined. Uh, both of those things make us make us different. Oh, so you must have a whole department set aside to sit and research and potential acquisitions that put to, towards you, uh, so you can look at three to four possible acquisitions every week. But you've only done three, which is quite impressive. So, can you walk me through the last one? Can you talk about why you bought the last one and how that fitted into your structure? Can you can you go through that journey? Yeah, well, the last one is actually a really uh, cool story that um, it, it's the, it's the perfect example for for what you're asking about. So, um, we uh, in the fall of 2020, 2020 we um, bought a company called Rosetta Stone, which is a language learning company, um, very famous brand. Um, also has a K twelve uh, side ha- had a K twelve side to it, but um, they also had this division called Lexia Learning, which was a literacy company. 
a, a K-12 literacy company, amazing company. Um, we ended up buying Rosetta Stone in the fall of 2020, right as we're getting ready to, to launch this new Cambium brand. Um, we almost immediately sold the language learning business to another company because it didn't really fit with its adult learning, its consumer. It really wasn't, it's really not what we're about. Um, but we kept Lexia, which was the, the focus of the acquisition. Um, we immediately said, okay, well, we, we usually make a decision when we do an acquisition. Is this company, it's a standalone business with a standalone value proposition, or does it sort of complement something we have? In this case, Lexia Learning w was very similar to a business we already had, which was called uh, Voyager Sopris Learning. Um, and we thought, okay, well, these companies really, if we bring them together, this is going to be kind of a literacy super brand uh, that will be unparalleled in the space. So we, we immediately brought those two organizations together into a single organization, which we called Lexia Learning. Um, we immediately moved to a branding project to rebrand that company, which we just launched. Uh, we launched in July of, of 2021. Um, and it was... All, so, so all of this happened in a matter of kind of, you know, 90 days, um, buying a company, splitting, splitting off the part that we were most focused on, selling the other part, merging the part we kept with a business we had to create something totally new. It was a, an absolute case of like one plus one equals four, where we suddenly had this scale for literacy, which is the most important uh, topic within the K-12 space. So um, it's... It's gone. It's gone spectacularly well uh, in terms of growth and um, building a, a launching a new brand, a single a single team. So efficiencies were gained, but we didn't. It, it wasn't like we came in and and um, let people go or reorganized and uh, pushed people out. We we just don't do that. It was it was more about bringing them together and then figuring out how do we how do we put this together in a way that's going to be really impactful. So. Um, the other two examples are, are great examples too, but that one in particular, because of the the kind of strategic uh, speed that we moved um, initially with the purchase and then everything that I described, it was really remarkable and it was it moved so quickly, but it 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 made sense. You know, it was something that was was great for the market and um, fit with us as a business and our strategy. So it's it's a tremendous example of um, how we tried to do uh, M and A. Interesting, very good. Um, in terms of uh, advertising, if you go into that sector across all your multiple brands, and I like the fact that you, if you buy a company, let the people stay. I think that that's awesome, by the way. But um, in terms of all the different brands and different structures you have spread out all over the country and all over the world, I, I presume. So are we focusing on Facebook, on LinkedIn? Are we focusing on conferences before when the world would still travel for the state level? Or, I mean, how is the advertising done can you go a little more detail with that or is that too specific for each unit um I, i'd say it's a two-part I, I think it's a good question and it's sort of there are sort of two levels to um to talk about i think one is uh, at, at the business unit level as you said they, they are all very different so you have some that are very digital centric other ones that are more traditional with um pre-pandemic, you know, field sales and conferences and things like that. So, um, so those are all, those are all different and th th sort of run the gamut of the tactical things that you would expect to see from, from companies like that. Um, I, I think when, when I take a step back and I, I'm very focused on the Cambium level, um, we're looking for ways to uh, build, build kind of not just brand awareness, but um, brand affinity where people say, wow, that, not only is that a successful company and a brand that I should be paying attention to because they're, they're growing and they're impactful, but they're doing something really remarkable. And they're um, they have a, a real distinct point of view uh, in a very crowded space. And so um, we, we had a couple of campaigns in particular uh, at the Cambium level that, that were just unbelievable for us um, to, to, to help us with that effort. So um, one in particular is we did a, when we launched the brand in November 2020, we we worked with a, a really talented filmmaker to do a um, to do a kind of short a short film called Honest Conversa Conversations, and the idea was that we we believed because of what we had been seeing that 
you know, students and teachers still weren't feeling seen, valued, and supported. And so we wanted to create a content piece that would start a conversation that would um, do so in a very um, human and kind of emotional way because um, students and teachers had just been begging for years to have a company um, see them and to help them. And so we, we create this amazing content and, and then we promote that via social channels, via other communications. We, we ended up having um, over 700,000 views of this video uh, that was all just about helping us launch a brand and start a conversation around, hey, if, if, if we're going to deal with some of these issues, we need to start giving voice to teachers, giving voice to students. And, and certainly Cambium has a, a brand that we feel is built all around that. Um, we did a second thing, which was was similar in the sense that it was it started with a piece of of, of video, um, and but this was much more uh, a bit more tactical actually. Which is um, one of our big challenges, like a lot of businesses, is you know this great resignation that's happening. Uh, people have all of this flexibility with the, with work now, and so um, ret- retain, retaining our, our staff, our, our, our really best staff, and then attracting new talent is just so critical for us. And so we created a video that was, we called Back to the Future, which is all about the the kind of legacy that Cambium has been um, accomplishing for, for years, you know, the, the great uh, milestones. And then also looking forward to the future to say, hey, we have a really aspir- aspirational vision of the future. We're just getting started. This is a place that you want to be. If you want to come do really meaningful work, here's where you want to be. Um, this is something we just launched uh, actually a couple of weeks ago, um, j- just three weeks ago. And in three weeks, we've had um, almost half a million views um, in three weeks of this. And so, it, you know, I, I think it's thinking about content that's of, of high quality, um, making sure that you are kind of tapping into the power of emotion, uh, because, you know, every I, I often remind people of this, you know, Every single person that we're trying to connect with, whether it's a teacher, a student, employee, like even investors, even investment bankers, they're all human beings. And, and we're all working together focused on this educational uh, you know, purpose that, that I talked about. So we're all people. So we have to create campaigns that give them a way to sort of see themselves and to um, take some, some sort of action from that. So that to me is um, kind of at the Cambium level where that then helps the business units by um, halo effect of being part of this this larger story. So, yeah, marketing is complicated uh, at a company like ours because it's just every it's every level. It's tactical. It's you know kind of brand building. It's it's everything. But emotional storytelling definitely works, and it's testament to five hundred thousand views and seven hundred seven hundred thousand views. If you can tap into that emotion and and give that honest uh, feel, um, people will connect with it, and and people are craving connection, especially these days. That's just my point of view. <laughs> Um, I, I began with saying that CMOs are not all we talked about earlier. It's not a protected title. Anyone can call themselves a CMO, which is great because people have different backgrounds and, and there's no exam one has to pass like a doctor or a dentist. So from your perspective as a CMO, what advice would you give to other CMOs that's out there that's that's just trying to look for advice? What would, what would you say, speaking from an almost billion dollar company, as you said? Yeah, no, I, and you're absolutely right. I mean, every business is different the CMO role is different. Even the CMO roles I've had have been very different, but, but I do think there are some foundational things that, um, that I just continue to, to learn through, through my own experience. Um, you know, I, so I, I, there, I think there are three things that I'll talk a little bit about. I think one is this idea, and, and I mentioned it earlier, but of being of service, you know, servant leadership is definitely like one of those business buzzwords that's out there. And, um, but at the same time, I think it's something that a CMO in particular really can't lose sight of that. I mean, the best leaders, um, re- they really understand how important trust is, um, not just to the, the, the organizational culture, but to the individual professionals that, that come to work wanting to, to have an impact. And so, you know, again, it's that we're all human beings thing. Um, you know, I think, I think the, best, the best way to build an organization um, that really does amazing things is to focus on building trust. And, and so how do you do that? You do that by hiring great people and then being of service to them, uh, not the other way around. I, I, I don't hire people thinking, oh, now you work for me and I've got all the answers. Um, and, and that can be really difficult, especially for newer CMOs who are still finding their way and still learning. Um, I mean, we're all always learning, but especially early on, it's just difficult to 
you know, you think, oh, I'm the CMO, I should have all the answers and I should be the one making all the decisions. And um, it, it's, it's a lesson most of us learn, uh, you know, the hard way to say, look, you need your team around you. And if you want to have kind of sustained year after year success, you've got to make that investment in your team, feel, feel approach everything as if you're of service to them. So um, being of service is one. A second one is, I just think about this sort of trusting the process. You know, it, it's difficult when you're a CMO that you can't, especially if you come up uh, through marketing ranks, um, to no longer be handling all the little details, especially things that you think you're really good at or that you have a lot of experience at, um, especially at a company like Cambium, which is is even larger in a portfolio structure. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not running all of the, the, the marketing teams or running all the campaigns or giving orders and making all the decisions. Um, I've, uh, there are teams that do that. And, and my role then is to um, be, be a positive influence and be consultative and be a coach and remain enthusiastic and positive and uh, looking forward. And at the same time, like being very focused on the present moment, you know, so it's listening to people and, uh, you know, pausing and asking questions. Like it's all of these things that, um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that I was a liberal arts major and uh, in in particular an English major. So um, a lot of those skills of just being able to make connections and to uh, to, to, to synthesize and, and, and listen to people and um, communicate, you know, those are things that are are super important as as a CMO. I am not, you know, I'm not focused on, um, uh, you know, looking at. Uh, metrics all the time and campaigns and all of the tactical things I did for years. Um, and, and that can be difficult. That can be difficult to make that shift where it's not about that. It's about uh, empowering that and supporting that. So um, going from uh, controlling numbers, numbers is certainly uh, encouraging people. So we, this, this numbers game versus the people's game. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um so I think that the third thing I'd say, and this isn't just related to CMOs, but I think it's it's very important for executives is um, you cannot lose sight of the things that really matter. And, and I know that seems really obvious, um, but I mean, how often have you seen great companies and great leaders that, uh, you know, chase a shiny object and then lose sight of who they are? Um, I mean, I can, I'm sure we can both think of a few examples, you know, in the news today, in fact, that probably uh, succumb to that. It's just, it's a very common thing and it's, and it's really easy to, to get distracted. And so I think it's important to um, take the time to, to, to be very deliberate about establishing what are the priorities um, and then, and then making sure that you stick to those. And that doesn't mean being rigid and being unwilling to shift gears or anything like that. I, you know, I often think about um, somebody gave me advice early on that when I was still, I was just learning how to, um, hire people and build teams. And, and they said, you know, hire slow and fire fast. And the idea I think there is um, the same when it comes to, it goes beyond hiring and firing. It, it comes down to just priorities, you know, be really deliberate and make sure that you're focused on the right things. And then when these shiny things come flying at you and these ideas come flying at you, um, if you've got that established and you've done a good job of communicating that and, and you've got the structures in place around those priorities, you can very quickly say, nope, we can't do that. Nope, we can't do that. Um, or if if maybe we can do that, but it's going to mean we can't do this other thing. So um, I think it gives you the, um, the ability to say no, uh, which is often really difficult, especially for, for newer executives that just want to, they want to please and they want to be of service in, with all the best of intentions. But um, you know, I think it's really important to stay focused. And I know that sounds like the most obvious thing in business, and it probably is, but it's also one of the things I see most often that people seem to forget. So um, it, it's, it's a good reminder. You know, the, the M&A strategy I mentioned is a great example of that. Like we're very disciplined. We have a very clear rubric on what we buy and what we don't buy. And that means we don't buy almost everything. That's impressive. I think that many CMOs out there, especially new ones and younger ones coming into the role, is because they only value in one thing, how much money they're generating. So it's a numbers game, right? So how I, how many views, how many links, how many conversions, how many click-through rates, and and bottom line, how much money came in. And if you don't perform, whoop, they're out or they're on to the next job. And it becomes this short-sighted uh, mindset uh, where they only focus on the next number, next campaign, as opposed to the bigger picture. And I think that's one of the things that I want to tell people is to also look at the bigger picture and take more time but that's just my opinion 
Yeah, and it's not an either or, right? Like, I mean, you 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 have to deliver, um, especially in a, a world that's dominated by um, investors, private equity firms, investment banks, venture capitalists. Like, you you have to perform, um, but that doesn't mean that you you just throw uh, caution to the wind and just focus on bringing in as much revenues you can today or even this quarter. Uh, you have to have a plan. I mean, you have to have sustained growth um, to be a value to anyone long term. So you're right. I think that that's, it's a very common thing and it's very, um, it's understandable, but at the same time, you know, it, some of that just comes with, with, with experience and with, with confidence and all the things that just take time. And, um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's tough. It's tough for new folks. So what's, uh, what's, what's keeping you up at night? What are you worried about uh, when you go to bed at night? What, what's in your mind? Yeah. I, so I, I, I think being in, I just feel the stakes are so high for a company like Cambium because we're in the education space and the education space. Um, certainly the pandemic has been accelerating some of this, but it, this is not a pandemic thing at all. Um, it's at an absolute crossroads right now. I, I mean, I, I'm constantly um, asking questions like, you know, when will we finally start making investments in teachers? When will we finally start like actually seeing them, valuing them, supporting them as, as professionals. Um, I mean, we're facing a huge crisis in the U S right now, and we, we just cannot stop um, asking those questions because too much is at stake and it requires the whole society to play some part citizens, governments, businesses like Cambium. And so, you know, I, I, I think about um, kind of like obvious existential threats like climate change, for example. And, you know, I, I, I kind of view, uh, education in the same way. Like we are beyond the time where investments need to be made in order for the narrative to change. And so um, because the stakes are so high, that's if, if we were a widget company, I might not wake up at 3.30 worried about things like that. I would be more focused on my numbers and all of that. But this is, you know, the, we all have kids. We all have, we all went to school. Like this is something that touches all of us. What's the, uh, what's the five-year vision? Where, what's, what do you see Cambia in the future? So I mentioned earlier that Cambium has grown by a factor of five uh, in the last five years. So growth is very important to us. Um, but again, it's not for all the reasons that growth is important for a business. Um, but for us, again, because it's education, it's not just about growth for growth's sake. It's because growth is the way that we will have a greater impact on those challenges. It's the way that we will realize our purpose and help the teachers and students feel more seen, valued and supported. If we want that to happen, we have to continue to scale. So that is our, our vision is to continue doing that. As I mentioned before, we continue to, to grow both uh, organically and inorganically. Um, we have got a very kind of strict um, playbook for our inorganic growth uh, through acquisition. And so um, that's what we're going to continue to do. We've, we've had just unbelievable success. Uh, we have every reason to believe that that's going to continue um, and we have no reason to think that we need to, to, to change a playbook that has had returns like that and growth like that uh, over the last five years. John, it's been absolutely a pleasure interviewing. Thank you for being on the podcast. I think your vision is, is great. I think you are a great company and you do great service to humanity. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, thank you, Thomas. At the end of every podcast, whether you're listening or whether you're watching us, I bring in Sane. And who is Sane? Sane is our producer who in the background is making us sound good, maybe not look good, but it's certainly making sure that we can, uh, we can, we can deliver a, a podcast that people can watch <laughs> or listen to. So thanks, Sane. Thank you for doing that. You're yeah. very welcome. At the end of it, every podcast, I always bring you in because I always like to hear your perspective. Uh, what do you think about this, uh, this podcast, this episode so far? Yeah, this was really interesting mainly because John and Cambium Learning Group are in a really interesting position right now uh, being, folk, uh, being a business focused on education and teachers, which is something we usually think of as more of a governmental thing. Um, and I think that their approach to it is very interesting and, and, and their brand of people first is really a great way to approach it. Um, a couple, one of the things that really struck me mm. is when John uh, kind of related the approach that they took during the b yeah. the beginning of the pandemic, yeah. where it's like, okay, let's not, let's not panic. Mm. Let's do the responsible thing, take a breath, listen to what people want uh, and, and then provide 
uh, provide that to them, and like that that was pro- providing the free. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so not only that, but then they gave the free access to students. Hey, yep. we'll figure it out later on. We want you to learn. We want to figure this out. We're all in this together. We have to come out of this together. And it's important that we support teachers. And that's what I meant by saying the humanity. Of course, they're a billion-dollar company. And, of course, they're making money and profit and shareholders. I'm not sitting here putting things rosy, rosy glass. I'm just saying from that point on, we say, okay, we'll provide our tools, some of our tools for free. I thought that was was great. Absolutely. And I think that is – I think we've we've spoken about it before, how that is a great way to earn brand trust Yes, when someone – knows that they can rely on a brand uh, for for what they need. Um, also, it, it's very interesting to negotiate that brand message across several different business structures. I, I It is very interesting uh, hearing about how John... Uh, John John approaches that like yeah. each business has its own marketing team and its own brand story, yeah. Yeah. but they are all kind of connected in underneath um, underneath this one umbrella yeah. of of people first, making sure that the people involved are heard and seen and feel heard and seen. That's yeah. what I really liked. I, I like that they um, that they. First of all, I, kudos to having that team that sits there and figure out three to four new possible <laughs> acquisitions every week. That's a lot of due diligence, going through a lot of stuff to come to that point. So should we do this or not so they can make the right decision? So kudos for that team to doing that. But then going through it and saying no, 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 only saying yes to three in the last five years, that's, that's, that's very, very disciplined. And only when it fits 100% we do it. But what struck me most about that was they said, we keep everyone in there. So we buy a company, we keep mm. everyone, the president's still the president, they see all, everybody, they, they still do their own thing, of course, under the umbrella, but they still do their own thing. We don't go in and change everybody up, kick everybody out and we take over and we run with it. I like that, that there's yeah. people first. So I, it's interesting to see that, that companies at the billion dollar level can think about you know, people first. It's still a yeah. value that's, we live in society, let's not go <laughs> wrong your word. It's capitalist thing. We've got to deliver results. We've got to perform, but we can still prioritize people first. I, I love that. And I think I think right at the end, uh, John wrapped it up by, by saying that uh, for him, it's the importance of having an aspirational vision of the future. Yes. So, uh, and communicating that to both your customers and yep. and your internal and your internal factions is basically we're here for this purpose and yep. this is what we're this is what we're going to do for the future don't you want to be a part of it i like that yeah emotional storytelling with hook. i love so, yeah yeah well that was a great episode thanks Absolutely. for helping us do this one saying you're very welcome we're on to the next one on to the next one 